in this recording, we're going to look at Chapter 10, which focuses on liabilities. And the nice thing, actually, about this chapter is that we've already covered a lot of the topics in Chapter 10. So I'm not going to actually lecture over everything. You're going to find a lot of it is just a review. So let's get started. We know, basically, the accounting equation, assets equal liabilities plus stockholders equity and that our assets are basically the resources of the company, the economic resources. Liabilities and stockholders' equity, right, those are our investors that we issue stock to, and then our liabilities are amounts that we owe to our creditors. And so if the assets are the resources, these two groups, groups over here have rights to those resources. And so that's a way of thinking about the basic accounting equation. So here's our resources. Here's the two groups that have rights to those resources. Okay, and so our obligations, if we think of liabilities in particular, are the creditors' rights or claims on these assets. And if I think of the word obligation, well, that's going to require me to do something in the future. And this idea that I will sacrifice something. So let's look at some typical liabilities or obligations. We know that we have accounts payable. That's because we bought something. So usually we have purchased something, and that causes us to have an account payable, right? We buy something, we haven't paid cash for it, so we owe for it. So in the future, the sacrifice or what we're going to give up is cash. Cash will be paid in the future. Same thing with utilities payable. That really represents you know, our unpaid utility bill, which is really unpaid usage of services, right? The unpaid usage of utilities. So we'll just say unpaid usage of services. So that could be utilities payable, wages payable. Both of those are services that we cons consume as a business. And if it's a payable, it's because we owe money on it. So down the road in the future, we will actually pay cash for that. So the typical, then, scenario is that when we have the account names, payable indicates we will pay cash in the future. Now, another liability that we've gone over before is this idea of unearned revenue. Here, we don't owe money. We actually owe goods and services. And unearned revenue is created because customers prepay. And that creates this unearned revenue. So they prepay, they pay in advance for goods and services. So cash comes in, and we have a liability. So again, you know, cash is going to come in at that time, and it creates, you know, that's one part of the transaction. And then, you know, we owe goods and services for that in exchange. So cash comes in, and we owe the customer goods and services in the future. So in the future, we're either going to give up our merchandise, our goods, or it might be services uh, that we provide. And, you know, when we provide goods and services, we earn our revenue, right? You know that from prior coverage. So we earn our revenue for pro providing the goods and services. Okay, that's liabilities and the idea of what do we sacrifice in the future. Now, let's look at classifications because we can classify liabilities as either short-term, which is current, or long-term. Current category generally means a liability will be paid within one year. Now, it's also possible, because Chapter 10 is going to get more in depth of this definition of a current liability, it could be, instead of a year, we would use the operating cycle if it's longer than a year. And that's really odd. Uh, it's really rare to have an operating cycle longer than a year. So, um, and if it is, we use the operating cycle as a cutoff time period. And let's kind of review there. I mean, what is an operating cycle? Let me go up here and I'll put an operating cycle up here. Really, you know, if we think about our normal operations, we buy goods, we're going to owe money for those in, so we don't pay cash. So we buy goods, right? We're going to put them in our store to sell. So then we sell the goods. You know, assume that we sell those on credit. That creates an account receivable. And then we have to allow time so that we collect our cash. So we buy goods. Usually uh, we're going to owe money for that. Uh, we turn around, stock them on our floor, sell the goods. 
We'll get an account receivable from our customer, possibly. Then we have to wait to collect it before we can actually pay off our account payable. And then we can turn around and buy goods all over again. And that's the operating cycle. Usually, usually the operating cycle, you know, is only, you know, several days or even weeks long. So it would be really unusual to have an operating cycle longer than a year. So generally speaking, current liabilities will be paid within a year. But in very rare situations, if this operating cycle is longer than a year, uh, then we would use whatever, how many days that is. Could be, you know, 400 days, whatever it is. A good example of an operating cycle that's longer than a year would be a company that constructs ships, um, because often those take longer than a year to actually build or construct a really, really large ship. And again, that's kind of a rare situation. Okay, so uh, what else about current versus long term? Uh, payment comes from current assets, mostly cash or through the creation of other current liabilities. So here we have information about current liabilities. Current liabilities get paid off with current assets. Uh, and generally, we can see here that's going to be cash. So let's go through an example. Let's say we have a $5,000 note payable, and it's due over five years, and the principal payments will be $1,000 each year. So how much of that is a current liability, and how much of that is long-term? Well, if there are $1,000 payments each year, so within the next year, $1,000 will be paid. And then after one year, a total of $4,000 will be paid. And again, they're going to be paid annually, but it'll be a total of $4,000. So we can see, even though uh, a li so we, so we can see a liability, a note can have part of it can be current, and a portion of the note can be long-term, and that's fairly common. So let's look at notes. Uh, we did this illustration earlier. Uh, actually, we went through this. Uh, Rec Room received an $8,000, 6% note to settle a balance. And here it was a note receivable. So in an earlier chapter, I think this was Chapter 7, we went over notes receivable, and we went through all of this. So uh, let's kind of look, you know, on November 1, let's review our journal entry. Uh, notes receivable came in, right? That's an asset. And we gave up accounts receivable. So we exchanged the account for a note. And we had talked about then, you know, the benefit for the company is if it's a note, the company can earn interest on it. So that happened on November 1. Two months later, it's the end of the year. And we accrue interest. So the company would have earned interest revenue, and they haven't received it yet, uh, so we would have uh, an interest receivable account. And let's go through that adjusting entry. Uh, remember, principal times rate times time is our formula for interest. So that was $8,000 principal. Uh, the interest rate is 6%. And it was only 2 out of 12 months. And so we had an $80 interest revenue. And keep in mind, even though it's a six-month note, when the interest rate is stated annually, time also has to consistently be stated on an annual basis. Okay, so then uh, we made that adjusting journal entry, right? And then if we stop right there, go down to our December 31st balance sheet, we had a note receivable and an interest receivable on the balance sheet. And then we had interest revenue we had earned on the income statement. All right, now let's go to the following year. Then in the following year, they're going to receive everything. So we did, you know, our $8,000, 6%. They're going to receive the full six months interest. Uh, which is $240. So again, we calculate it's a six-month note. They're going to receive the full six, month, six months interest. However, they will have only earned this year four months interest, which is 160 
So they're going to receive a full six months, but they only earned four months. So let's kind of go over that again. So, you know, here's 2016. Here's 2017. And so the note starts here, and we earn two months interest in 2016. Then it's the end of the year. And then another four months go by, and we're going to collect that note. So we'll earn four months interest in the following year, 2017, but we're going to collect the entire six months of interest. So let's go look at how to record all of that. So cash would have come in, right? That's principal plus interest. Uh, so we had $8,000 of principal. We said the total interest was two forty. So we're going to collect all of that. There was four months interest earned which was 160. We also, you know, when this is all said and done, interest receivable will be zero. So we reduce, I said interest, excuse me, note receivable will be zero. So reduce note receivable for the 8,000. So we had 8,000. We subtract 8,000 and it ends up being zero. Interest receivable had 80 in it at the end of the year. We want to decrease it, 80, so it zeroes out. So we zero out the receivables by crediting them uh, and record our four months interest earned. So then what goes on the balance sheet? We've got cash, the receivables zeroed out, and then we had interest revenue of 160. So again, we recognized two months or recognized and earned two months interest in one year and then the other four months the following year. Now I went through all of that again because we already demonstrated this in a prior uh, lecture, but it's the same thing. We're going to go over and we're going to be the debtor, account for the debtor, uh, you know, and, and what would that look like? So here we accounted for rec room. If we go over and do Barry's Burgers, uh, here we're the debtor. So here we are exchanging an account payable in exchange for a note payable. So here we're the, we owe the money. So we're going to get rid of our account payable and exchange it for a note payable. Two months interest goes by, two months go by, and we will incur interest expense. Remember that was $80, and we haven't paid it, so we're going to owe $80 of interest. So let's go down to our balance sheet. Under liabilities, we'll have an $8,000 note payable and an $80 interest payable. So two months there. And then we also will have interest expense of $80 on the income statement. Then, right, that's the end of 2016. Let's go to the following year. We're going to have four months of interest incurred. That was the $160. These two accounts, we want those to zero out, so I will decrease both of those by their balance. So decrease note payable for its 8000 decrease interest payable $80. And then the total cash payment was at 8240 That was all the principal and interest. So cash will go out or will give up, write a check for 8240 that's principal of $8,000 and interest of $240. That represents six months' interest. Okay, let's go to our 2017. These two accounts zero out. We pay cash. Of course, there wouldn't really be, uh, a, you know, a negative cash balance, but I'm going to show there would be a cash payment of $8,240. That's not really its balance. And then we'd have this $160 of interest expense. So again, we have our two months interest expense and four months interest expense allocated over two years. Okay, so that's notes and reviewing of notes. The other topic I want to talk about is in your chapter nine notes. So let's stop and take a go back to your chapter nine notes. Okay, in our chapter 9 notes, we're going to flip all the way through towards the very end, and when we looked at ratios. Oh, we passed it. Okay, here we had uh, 
where financial analysis demonstration problem for both chapter 9 and 10. Uh, and I just want to review a little bit. Remember Hershey Food, very big company, and we wanted to compare it with some competitors that aren't, and unfortunately they're not as big of an organization. And we can see with this chart, Rocky Mountain has these huge bar graphs. The other companies are these little ones. So we had talked about, you know, if we only compare numbers, Hershey Food is always going to win. It's always going to look like it's better. So to really get at things, what we want to do then is convert things to percentages. So we did that. We already did the first three. We saw those ratios in Chapter 9. Chapter, the Chapter 10 ratio I want to look at today is this debt-to-asset ratio. And just a reminder, in my demonstration, uh, keep in mind when I have, you know, total liabilities, those really are the average, average liabilities, average assets. In your Wally Plus homework, recall you had to take the beginning plus the ending. You're given two numbers. So if you're given two numbers, you take the beginning balance plus the ending balance and divide by two to get that average. I'm just bypassing that calculation. It's pretty straightforward. So, uh, so anyhow, when we look at debt to assets, then we are looking at average total liabilities divided by total assets. Okay, so you know, go through. Uh, you can kind of do this on your own. We're going to, you know, take total liabilities and divide by total assets. So for Hershey Foods, I'll take 32.85, divide by 36.34. Tootsie Roll, this number, divided by that number, and Rocky Mountain 4, divided by 16. And when I do that, you're going to get something like 90%, 22%, and 25%. And clearly, Hershey Foods is the, very, the biggest number so it's the biggest number. The question is, is that good okay, to have such a large number there? Well, really what this indicates, when I'm you know, looking at debt as a percentage of assets, I'm really looking at how does the company finance its assets? So, uh, you know, let's just sort of look at this. Uh, you know, if we say the assets are 100% of itself, let's go back to Hershey Food. We said Hershey Food finances 90% of its assets with liabilities. So let's do this. Hershey Food. If assets are 100% of themselves, right, and liabilities are 90%, then that tells me stockholders' equity is the remaining 10%. Uh, Tootsie Roll. And again, assuming assets are 100% of themselves, we calculated it's financing 22% of its assets with debt. So that means the remaining 78% are financed with equity. And then lastly, Rocky Mountain. So Rocky Mountain finances 25% of its assets with debt or liabilities. So that means the remaining 75% is financed with stockholders' equity. Well, what difference does this make? Well, we have to think about what are the costs of financing with debt versus what are the costs of financing with equity? Well, if I borrow money, the cost of borrowing money is what? What's interest? And I have to pay back the principal, right? So if I borrow money, I have to pay interest and of course I have to pay back the principal that I borrow. If I finance with equity, which is stock, right? Generally, that's common stock. If I issue a stockholder's equity, the cost of that, possibly, is that I'll make dividend payments. But those are optional, right? We, the board of directors do not have to declare dividends. So it's optional whether we pay our shareholders dividends or not. So because of this, Debt, just by its nature, is considered more, uh, more financially risky than ish, uh, financing with stockholders' equity. So again, just by its nature, debt carries more financial risk than stockholders' equity. So given that then, you know, we can see, wow, Hershey Foods is really out there. Our conclusion would be, you know, Hershey Foods... carries 
you know, it bears or carries a larger financial risk than the other two companies. So this really is just assessing financial risk. And I do want to make a point also before we finish this topic. Find it, you know, it's a risk. And sometimes, though, we're going to see when we get into Chapter 11, we're going to look at sometimes it can be advantageous to take on this financial risk because it can actually create value for our shareholders if used properly. So we're going to see sometimes it can work to the, sh the benefit of the shareholders if a company finances the way Hershey Foods has done. Has, has done. Uh, but at the same time, it is risk, and they're taking on a heavier financial risk. Uh, finally, there is one more ratio in Chapter 10. It's called Times Interest Earned. I'm going to let you use your book to just look that formula up. This is not as strong as a ratio as the debt to asset ratio. This is a very significant ratio. This is more of a minor one. So I'll just let you, you can look up the formula in the book and then just apply that. So I'll let you get that on, on your own. Okay, I think I pretty much have covered everything that you're going to need uh, for your homework, except the smaller topics that we may have already covered in prior chapters.